So next up, we have Rebecca Jones. Um, she's Assistant Professor of Neuroscience in the Department of Psychiatry at Weill Cornell Medicine. And she's going to be speaking to us about some novel techniques to try and capture the behaviors and characterize autism. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to be here today. So in the field of medicine, we have some really clear measures that will let us know if our treatments are working. So in the case of diabetes, we have a blood test that looks at different types of sugar levels. In obesity, we can see if someone is losing or gaining weight. And in oncology, we can use radiology to see if tumors are shrinking and gr or growing. Now, in autism, it's not that simple. So as Lisa just illustrated, we are going off of behavior. And behavior can look very different from one child to another. So what do we have to see if our treatments are working in autism? So kind of the common measurements that we have are clinical judgment that happens in a clinical setting where a clinician will work with a child and assess their behavior. And we also have parent report where we ask our parents to tell us over the last couple of weeks or even the last couple of months, how does your child look? Now in both of these cases, this is often missing behavior that's happening in the home or the school setting, which is critical to figure out if a child is improving as a result of a treatment. They also, they also are both limited by expectancy effects. And what I mean by that is we know both from our research as well as from others that both clinicians and parents sometimes have biases and expectations about how a child's behavior might be changing that influences their perception of the behavior. And so what I'm going to be showing you today is our, our kind of um, approach of using mobile and wearable technology to see if we can measure treatment change in children with autism. And so what I'm going to be doing is showing you a couple of different um, areas of research that we've been working on in, uh, in my laboratory as well as with my colleagues. Specifically, I'm going to tell you about some work that we've been doing with language, uh, where we've been using these small recorders. They're about the size of a credit card. They fit inside a pocket of a t-shirt, and they measure everything that the child is saying, as well as um, uh, within six feet of the child. So it gets also the parent um, or the sibling who's um, in the proximity. Uh, we also have um, been using smartphones to uh, measure parent report. And the idea here is whether or not we can capture day-to-day -day variability from our parents uh, outside of the clinical context. We've also been using wrist sensors, which measure subtle changes in sweat response of the child. And the idea with this is whether or not we can pick up in uh, small changes that are happening in the internal state of the child that might uh, be indicative of changes of behavior that we wouldn't necessarily be able to get by observation alone. And then lastly, I'm going to be telling you about some more recent work that we've been doing where we've been using wearable glasses that have an outward facing camera between the eyes and they're able to readily pick up um, the child's patterns of gaze. So the way that we've been testing these various devices is we've designed an eight week protocol that looks very similar to a treatment trial, but we did not deliver any treatment. And so we had participants come into the clinic. Uh, we had them complete a series of standardized assessments, and then we had them um, go home with these various devices. So the parent had an app on their smartphone, the child had the wrist sensor, and also the t-shirt that had the language recorder in it. And we said, use these devices in the home setting as much as you can. They then came back at week four. They completed another series of standardized assessments. We sent them ag again home with these various devices. And then the last visit was on week eight. They again completed these standardized assessments, and we sent them home with the various devices. And the data that I'm going to be showing you is from 20 individuals and their families. Um, all of the children had autism. They were between 5 and 13 years of age. And all of the caregivers were biological parents, um, with over, over half having a graduate degree. So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about the language data that we collected. And this has all been in collaboration with a group at Georgia Tech led by Mark Clements and his team. And so when we started this study, we knew we would be getting a lot of data, but I don't think we knew that we would be getting this much data. Um, so it was over 300 hours of audio recordings. 
And right now, the way that the field typically measures language is um, a research assistant will go ahead and listen to the recording and transcribe every time they hear the child speak and what the child said. And so in our case, uh, this was not a scalable type of operation. And so uh, with Mark Clements and his group, we have been working on automating how we detect the child's utterances. And so we've developed a new pipeline that uses an I vector based annotation system. And right now, we are about 90% accurate at not only being able to identify the child's speech in a clinical setting, but about the same in a home setting. And I think that was really exciting to us because we're not controlling anything that's happening in the home. The TV can be on, siblings can be screaming. Um, and so we're still able to assess the child's speech at a fairly high accuracy. Now, certainly 100% is kind of the gold standard here, but 90% is actually quite good. And so. Now that we had been able to detect the child's speech, our next question was, what would this look like across contexts? And what I mean by that is, we might feel very comfortable of how we're assessing the child in the clinic, but we have really no idea how that corresponds to what's happening in the home environment. And so what we found is that there was a fairly decent amount of consistency in the level of utterances that are spoken in the clinic, that's on the y-axis here, relative to the utterances that are being expressed in the home. And this was quite exciting to us because it's basically saying what we're observing in the clinic is quite similar to what we uh, parents are viewing in the home setting. We also found that there was a fair amount of consistency across the various weeks. Now, as I mentioned, there was no treatment that was delivered, so we didn't expect that language would increase or decrease over time. And so what we found, as we expected, the children who spoke a lot in week one were the same children who spoke a lot in week two, and similarly, sorry, uh, at week eight. And so overall, what this is demonstrating is some clear consistency amount of language in the home versus the clinic, as well as across different weeks. And so our next step was, how would this relate to our clinical measurements of autism severity? And so as we would predict, kind of overall language that's uttered over the entire clinical visit corresponds to kind of the gold standard measurements of social communication with the ADOS. And so what you're seeing here is that individuals who had less severe autism symptoms on the ADOS spoke more in the clinic, um, as we would predict, compared to those children who had more severe autism symptoms. But the question was, what would this, how would this translate to the home? So what we're assessing in the clinic is that similar to what parents see in the home setting. And this is also what we found, such that children who had less severe autism symptoms in a clinical setting were the same kids who were also talking a lot in the home setting. And so this is demonstrating that language produced in the home is consistent with clinical observations. And so where we're going with this is not simply just to think about the number of utterances that a child speaks, but we're moving now into thinking about quality, so conversation turns. Um, how many kind of back and forth um, kind of types of conversations we see between a child and a parent. Because I think that that's important to think about interventions. Um, and so we're not simply just trying to increase the number of utterances that a child makes, but really trying to improve the quality of their language as well. Okay, so I'm going to move now to briefly speaking about the smartphone app uh, that we used in our study. And what we did is we asked parents to fill out daily questions about how irritable their child was, um, how many kind of um, their mood for the day, their disruptive behaviors. Um, and the idea was, could we capture changes on a day-to-day -day basis that might be missed by more kind of standardized paper questionnaires that ask about kind of uh, many weeks at a time? And so what we found is that there was great consistency between single questions about mood, irritability, and disruptive behaviors, and these more kind of common paper questionnaires that are um, kind of standard in the field, such as the PNAS, the ABC, and the CBCL. And so what that demonstrated to us is that single questions on the smartphone potentially could be able to replace some of these lengthier questionnaires going forward. Interestingly, we found that higher levels of maternal education were associated with um, more se se severe negative mood, irritability, and disruptive behaviors. And this was really surprising to us. Um, the sample is small, um, and we also have a very highly educated sample. And so I think that this is an, uh, an area for kind of future research to see if it can be replicated. 
One of the key goals with deploying the smartphone was this idea of capturing day-to-day -day variability um, from our caregivers. And so what we did is we came up with a single metric that allowed us to say from zero to one, kind of how uh, big or small were the changes over the course of the eight weeks and how parents rated their child's behavior. One being that there was a lot of change from day to day, zero being very little. Our next question was, okay, now that we'd measured variability, did we actually need eight days worth of data to be able to capture, sorry, eight weeks of data to capture that variability, or did we actually need um, only a few days in the beginning and the end of the study? And so the punchline is that we actually found you only needed to sample from 10 days in the beginning of the study and 10 days at the end of the study to be able to capture the same variability as if you use data from the whole eight weeks. And so the way that we figured this out is we um, did a, a series of analyses where we um, kind of performed truncated analyses. And the, the x-axis here is um, demonstrating five days in the beginning or five days at the end. And each line here is representing a single question on the smartphone. And what you see is that they're all reaching significance by around 10. And so the idea here is that 10 days at the beginning, 10 days at the end of the study captures variability as if you used all eight weeks worth of data. And what I, I think we, we view this as is kind of this opportunity to potentially reduce bear, uh, burden on caregivers going forward, with the idea being they don't necessarily have to answer a question on their smartphone every day to be able to give us the same amount of information as if they just did it at the beginning and the end. Okay. Um, I'm going to move now to talking briefly about the sweat behavior that we collected from the wrist, and this has been done in collaboration with Matthew Goodwin and Ian Kleckner. So similar to the language data, I don't think that we knew going in how much, how much data this actually would be, so we had over 181 hours um, of autonomic arousal data. And the way that the field typically measures this is um, someone also manually goes through and says, yes, that was an increase in a sweat response, or no, that was a decrease in a sweat response. Again, not possible with this quantity. And so we came up with a, a pipeline to be able to figure out what was good data and bad data. And the details here are not all that important, but the idea being that once we kind of established this pipeline, we had over 120 hours worth of good data and 61 hours of data that was not, um, was not usable. When we started this experiment, I think we were curious whether or not there would even be variation on a day-to-day -day basis in our young children with autism. Um, and so what I'm plotting you, uh, for you here is a, a single subject and just three days' worth of her data. And I think all of you probably could tell that certainly day three looks to be different than day one and day two. And so to kind of move these analyses forward, we just turn to very standard statistics using means and standard deviations, such that a high mean would just mean that you had a higher level of sweat response for that day, and a high standard deviation, meaning that you had a lot of variability uh, on that day. And so to think about what does it mean if you had a, a high level of sweat or a high variability, we turn back to the ratings that we got from the parents on the smartphone. And what you're looking at here is kind of the way that we went through our analyses, where we first started with our participants. They had each day's worth of data. Then they had um, segments of data that were good from the uh, wrist sensor. And we linked that up with the smartphone data. And what we found is that higher levels of sweat response on the wrist sensor predicted uh, parents reporting that their child had had a very irritable day and that children who had greater variability on their sweat response also were being reported by parents as having ver a lot of irritability that day. So we're seeing kind of really nice kind of convergence across these two measurements. And kind of where we're moving forward with this um, is thinking about kind of now starting to predict um, events that are happening within those days. So we are interested in thinking about tantrums, for example, and if there's any way to predict the onset of a tantrum. Okay. So with the time remaining, I'm just going to briefly talk about some new work that we've been doing with wearable glasses. Um, and Lisa mentioned uh, joint attention or shared engagement before. Um, this idea that you make eye contact, you look at an object in the environment, and you make eye contact again. Now, the way that the field um, commonly measures this type of behavior is someone goes through the video and marks every time they see these types of shifts. 
this is um, very time consuming and also error prone. Um, so working with my colleagues um, at Georgia Tech, particularly uh, Jim Ray and Agata Roska, we've been thinking about ways to automate these types of measurements. And the way that we've been doing that is using a standard camcorder view um, as well as these wearable glasses. So the goal with this work is going to be thinking about how we can automate um, some of our measurements of joint attention and shared engagement with the idea that it ultimately could potentially replace manual, more time-consuming methods and ultimately improve our understanding of social behavior. So um, we recently received a grant from the NIH to extend this work to also not only include the glasses in the standard camcorder, but also now um, wrist sensors that look at acceleration um, of the child's arm movements and and so thinking about gestures um, as well as kind of body movements and head movements overall with this idea of not only being able to develop automatic tools um, but also to provide us with information about kind of subtle changes in nonverbal communication that we might not be able to collect simply by someone manually coding a video. Ultimately, the idea is that these tools could be disseminated um, to researchers, but also to clinicians who might be interested in using them to assess a child um, kind of on a one-off type of visit, but also just as important to think about change over time um, and thinking about using these measurements to see if treatments are working. So in conclusion, I think that we have some promising new tools. Um, we're moving forward with, with automated language detection, with single questions on the smartphone that might be able to replace lengthier questionnaires, the sweat response that does seem to show some convergence with the smartphone data, as well as direct gaze detection. And I demonstrated to you today some of the confirmed uh, validity with these, with these measurements, and we're also continuing this research. And so I don't necessarily think we're, um, we're ever going to get to a point um, with the outcome measurements that I started with, but I do think that we're making important progress. And so with that, I would like to say thank you particularly to Kathy Lord um, and to uh, research assistants uh, Amaral Hamo and Caroline Carberry who helped collect a lot of the data. Thank you. It's a great question. So for the language, we, we, um, we do have um, uh, automatic detection of the adult voice as well, and the percentages are just um, equal in terms of around 90% accurate at being automatically able to detect the adult, and then we are looking at kind of that back and forth behavior. Um, it's been very hard to think about kind of how to automate the back and forth piece, right? Because just because you have uh, a three-point term, but you're talking about the same thing over the, the course of the eight weeks, that's not necessarily um, showing improvement. Um, for the glasses, we, we have a study where the parents have worn the glasses, um, and so we're looking at um, differences in gaze behavior when the child is interacting with um, the parent versus when they're interacting with the clinician, um, and we're seeing differences there where, as we might predict, the children have increased increased uh, direct gaze when they're, when they're engaging with their parent um, versus the clinician. So I do think that um, you're, you're right of thinking about ways that we can kind of extend these tools to get more of the kind of the dyadic back and forth um, type of behaviors. Yeah. 